Hi everyone, thanks for joining in today. I'm excited to have Natasha Lester joining us. Um, so Natasha is the New York Times bestselling author of The Paris Seamstress, The French Photographer and The Paris Secret, and was a former marketing executive for L'Oreal. Her novels have been translated into many different languages and are published all around the world. And when she's not writing, she loves collecting vintage fashion, practicing the art of fashion, illustration, and reading about history. Natasha is a sought after public speaker and lives with her husband and three children in Perth, Western Australia. And her latest book is The Riviera House. And just want to mention as well, anyone watching the Facebook Live, if you've got a question for Natasha, just type it in comments and I'll read it out to her and you'll have a chance, thanks to Hatcher, to win a copy of the Riviera House. So thanks so much, Natasha, for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting. <laughs> just wondered if you wanted to start off by telling us a bit about the Riviera House. Of course. So... This is the Riviera House, and it is about a young woman named Eliane, who is an art lover. The book opens in Paris in 1939, when Eliane is working at the Louvre Museum. And then the Nazis occupy Paris as part of World War II, and Eliane is forced to move to a different Parisian art museum to work, one called the Jus de Pomme. And on her very first day at work, as she approaches the museum, she sees that it's surrounded by armed Nazis, she has no idea why an art museum would need to be guarded by armed soldiers. And then inside the museum, she sees gathered there a collection of more artwork than one of the biggest museums in the world could possibly gather together for an exhibition. So she's trying to work out where the artworks come from, why it's there and where it's being sent to. And as part of that, she meets at the museum at Real Life Art Spy Rose Vallonde. And the two of them begin working on a dangerous mission for the French resistance to keep track of all the artworks the Nazis are stealing. Thanks for that. And um, we've got a lot of people already watching, which is really great. Um, Hi everyone. <laughs> Sharon wonders if you did a lot of research for the book. I did. Um, so, in fact, it's hard to know where to begin with all the mm. research I did. I mean, I guess the first thing to say about that is that the papers to do with the Nazis art thieving during the Second World War are kept in 35 different archives in 12 different countries. Oh, wow. So, I know. So, it's a massive amount of paperwork. And also, um, you know, when you're writing about something that, you know, people refer to as the art holocaust, mm. you have this obligation to make sure you are you've done your research and you're coming at it from a point of actually knowing what really happened. So obviously didn't visit 35 different archives in 12 different mm. countries because that's, that would, you know, take me more time than it would take to write the book. But right. I um, worked out which two archives had the most important papers. So the uh, Musée National Archives in Paris have all of Rose Vallon's actual handwritten notebooks from mm. the painting she was recording, the theft she was recording, during the war so I went there and looked at all of Rose's actual documents because Rose actually existed and is a character in the book mm -hmm. and I also went to the National Archives in Washington because um, they the Allied Art Looting Investigation Unit um, basically originated in America and so all of the interrogation reports from people like Herman Goering who were stealing artworks and the man who ran the Jeu de Paul Museum during the war were all kept in Washington. So that was one part of it. And then, you know, just getting down on the ground in Paris, really. Um, so I went to the Jeu de Paul Museum. Um, I wanted to see, you know, feel what that was like inside, mm -hmm. um, you know, where Eliane actually lives in the book. That's a real apartment and a real covered passageway. Mm -hmm. um, and then the contemporary storyline is set in the French Riviera. So it was absolutely essential to go down to the French Riviera and um, do lots of fabulous research down there too. So yes, lots of research, but I enjoy the research. I enjoy, you know, sitting in a dusty archive as well as just walking the streets and taking lots and lots of photographs so that hopefully the book feels really authentic for readers. Yeah. So because you were able to visit all those places, does that mean you started with this book before COVID? I was very lucky. I did the research in December 2018 and okay. January 2019. So yeah. it was like a year before everything really mm. collapsed. I mm. don't know what, 
there are some books maybe that you can get away with not doing on the ground research, but mm-hmm. this one, like I don't think that I would have been able to write it without having been to those places. So yeah, yeah I was really lucky that it wasn't my yeah. pandemic book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would certainly make it pretty hard if you weren't able yeah. to. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> um, Patricia wonders if you have a strict writing regime. Uh, I do. I'm pretty much uh, a routine follower and a believer in routine. And I guess that's because when I first started writing, um, I had three babies, basically, three kids mm. under the age of four, which mm. was insane. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> um, so my writing time was limited to when they were having their day sleeps. So some days that might be half an hour, some mm. days it might be an hour and a half. And so I learned really quickly to use that time to its maximum capacity. You know, I wouldn't even let myself go to the toilet because there wasn't <laughs> enough time to pee. So, but, and I hated it at the time because it felt like I was never had enough time and I was cramming into these small mm-hmm. chunks of, of time. But, you know, it taught me to be really disciplined. Mm-hmm. And I think that then when the kids went to school and I suddenly had, you know, nine to three available to write, it meant that I, I still didn't waste time because I'd learned not to from them. So, mm-hmm. Really, my days, um, I go for a run in the morning because um, that's kind of part of my writing process. It just gets me thinking and I usually make up scenes while I'm running and then I get to my desk by about nine and I really work all the way through till about 3.30 when I have to go and pick the kids up from school. Um, And then I usually come back to my desk every night for about an hour from, say, 7.30 till 8.30 and that's mainly for admin and stuff. I write best during the day yeah. um whereas at night I'm pretty tired but there's always a ton of admin to get through and if I don't do that bit at night then that just mounts up and I've suddenly realized I've got 17 million emails yeah. that I haven't replied to so yeah. so yeah that's pretty much how my day works yeah <laughs> and do you set yourself goals for the day yeah I do so when I'm writing a first draft I I like to write those really quickly mm. uh, and just get the story out because I don't tend to plan up front so I have a word count that I try and achieve so I can get that done kind of right around school terms I like um to write a draft and then have some time to just put it away and think about it and so mm. if I get a draft finished in the sort of 10 week school term then I've got two weeks automatically where it's much harder to write there's three kids in the house so I can just put it aside and think about it and then pick it back up again in the next term so that generally is how my my life is structured yeah. around the school year. Yeah, yeah. And Wendy wonders where your interest of France or Paris comes from. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I um, did study the French language all the way through high school up until year twelve, and I really loved loved it. And then um, I started travelling to France, and then I ended up working for L'Oreal, which is a French company, for a number of years. And, you know, we had to speak a lot of French there and, mm. uh, you know, we were translating packaging from the French into English, for example. Mm. Um, so that was another kind of little French connection in my life, I suppose. And then when I started writing, uh, the first book that I wrote that was set in France was, or partly set in France, was The Paris Seamstress. And um, I just loved you know, having to go to France for research, for work. (laughs) And I really liked the way the story unfolded. And, you know, I always think that if you're writing something you love, then hopefully it shows to the reader in the Mm -hmm. book. So, um, and and then kind of when you're researching in an area and in an era and an area, you tend to find ideas for your next books there. So it sort of kind of goes on a bit like that. Um, so, yeah, it's really been just the, from the love of the language initially and then having, you know, visited there a lot, um, mm-hmm. learning to love the country as well and the people and having worked for a, a French company too. Yeah. And Kelly wonders, oh, well, sorry, Kelly says that um, she loves the way you combine true stories with fiction and she wonders what comes first. Is it the true story that comes first? And yeah, always. So for me, it's always, I'll be, uh, you know, researching a book and I'll come across a mention of a, a woman or an organisation that had women in it at a time where women didn't do that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And and I'll, part of my brain will go, that's it, that's your next book idea. So, that, I mean, that's basically how it happened when I was writing a, The Paris Seamstress. I came across uh, an article about Lee Miller, who was Vogue's war correspondent during the Second World War. And I was like, wow, who knew that Vogue had a female war correspondent mm. during the Second World War? Mm. So I'm going to write about her. So that became the French photographer. 
And then when I was researching that, I discovered both the story of Catherine Dior, who worked with the French resistance during the Second World War, and also the female pilots who flew the RAF's planes during the mm -hmm. Second World War. So that was like, okay, that's going to be my next book. So that became the Paris Secret. Mm -hmm. Then when I was researching that, I um, heard about Rose Lalonde, you know, who risked her life to save artworks mm -hmm. during the Second World War. And I hadn't heard that story before. I, you know, I'd heard about people risking their lives to save other people, but not for something like art. And yeah. so I was like, okay, Rose is going to be part of the next book. So mm -hmm. it's always the, the the woman or her position or her job, um, what she did in history that stands out as being mm -hmm. remarkable, that attracts me to want to write about a particular story. Mm -hmm. And have you always got the idea from when you've been researching from for another book? Or Yeah, these yeah. days it's basically how it happens um my first historical novel was a kiss from mr fitzgerald and that came out in 2016 and so that idea just came from a a biography of emily dickinson of all things that i was reading at the time mm. but then from there the ideas have kind of spun out of the research which which is great actually um mm. so it means that you know there's always i'm really a one idea at a time writer and lots of writers say they have you know, drawers full of ideas they can mm. kind of pick and choose from. Mm. Um, that's not how my, my brain obviously likes to just attach onto one thing and hold <laughs> on to it, which is a bit stressful because you always think, oh, gosh, what if I don't get that one idea? What if it never mm. comes? Um, but luckily, you know, I do so much research that generally speaking, there's something in there that, you know, sets my brain sparking. Thank yeah. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and um, talking about ideas and that, Patricia's wondering if you've started on your next book and if there's anything you can tell us about it. Yes. So my next book is called The Three Lives of Alex St. Pierre and it is coming out in September next year in Australia. I think it's going to be January 2023 in the US. Mm -hmm. um, but don't quote me on that. These things <laughs> move yeah. around, especially in COVID times. Yeah. Um, so that is about the experience of women post the Second World War, because a lot of my books are focused on women during the Second mm -hmm. World War. But actually, the, uh, the few years immediately following the Second World War are really interesting because you have all those women who are doing these incredible things during the war you know some are spying for their country mm -hmm. and flying airplanes mm -hmm. and then after the war the government is basically you know running propaganda campaigns to encourage women to quit their jobs and, and go back and work in you know be a housewife um mm -hmm. which and there's nothing wrong with that but mm -hmm. it just meant that for many women all of a sudden these their independence was just literally pulled out from underneath them and so i wanted to write a book that deals a bit with that um so my main character is Alex St. Pierre, obviously, from the title, yeah. and she is uh, the publicist at the just launching house of Christian Dior in Paris in 1947. Mm -hmm. So it's got a Paris and a fashion storyline in there as well, which was yeah. lots of fun to write. Yeah, sounds exciting. <laughs> Sharon said she loves the cover, and I can see you've got um, two different covers there as well. Is the yeah. other one the US? Cover, so this it? one is the US cover, which yep. is beautiful too, and mm -hmm. then this one is the Australian cover. So um, they quite, tend to get they're quite different, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And then the UK cover is completely different oh, again. Really? It's okay. really blue and bright and summery. So they tend to get rejacketed mm -hmm. in each of the countries depending on you know what the publishers think works in their market mm. so um that's always good fun to have lots of different beautiful books to look yeah, at yeah <laughs> yeah and sharon's wondering if you have any say in anything at all on the cover um yeah i do actually i'm really lucky particularly in australia i get quite a lot of say um so we're in fact my publisher and i are already talking about the cover for the book for next september because mm. we start chatting about that quite early and i've just sent a whole lot of um mood board photos over to my US publisher for that yeah. same book. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to know what I would like and what my thoughts are. And then often with my Australian publisher, we we toss things back and forward. She's, I'm a perfectionist, but mm -hmm. I think she's probably even more of a perfectionist than I am. <laughs> so we've never come to a point where she's presented a cover that I haven't liked. It's always because we've worked so collaboratively, by the time the cover um, that covers come through and like this one took months to yeah. get right it's really hard mm. to find the woman mm. for the front that's mm. the hardest part so there's a lot of time and effort involved in sending photos back and forth of different women that mm. aren't just aren't right so mm. so I'm, I'm lucky and um very grateful as well that i do get to be involved in that process yeah. um which means i end up always getting a book that i 
I'm happy to hold up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds like you do have quite a lot of input compared to some other authors that I've spoken to before. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's great. Um, Belinda wonders what were your favourite books when you were growing up? Oh, so I was the child who literally went to the library every week um, mm. and took out an armload of books. I even had, um, I don't know, if you're my age, um, you might remember those blue school exercise books that had the line pages inside them. And oh, so yes, I yeah. had a list mm. in there of all the different series that I was reading, like Famous Five and Secret Seven and oh, Dancing and Drew and Sweet Valley yeah. High. And yeah. I would tick them off when I'd read them so I could mm. keep track of what I'd read. I was that much of a book nerd. <laughs> um, so, yeah, probably a lot of the things that a lot of people were. There was definitely an Enid Blyton phase. Mm. I was totally into Sweet Valley High. So I was um, Team Jess all the way, mm -hmm. um, not Team Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> and I Love Little Women. That was one of my favourite books. And I read Jane Eyre when I was about 13 mm. and adored that from that age. And it's still one of my favourite books. Um so, yeah, a bit of a mix of pretty much all the classics from that kind of era, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Patricia's wondering about the titles of your books. Do you choose your titles? Yeah, so I always have a working title on there and then sometimes that gets changed um, in consultation with the publisher um, and then sometimes it doesn't. So, like, the Riviera House was the title I had on the book from the time I started working on it and it ended up being called the Riviera House. Yeah. Um, with next year's book, for example, I had a working title on there of To Lily from Paris because part of the book is some letters that Alex is writing to her friend mm -hmm. Lily. And um, we sort of agreed between the UK and the US and Australia that it didn't work for everyone. And then my US publisher came up with The Three Lives of Alex St. Pierre, which I just jumped on because I love and adore that title. And so I was like, yes, I want that to be my title um so so it's always the case that if the title does get changed again i get to have input and you know we had a zoom meeting in fact just a couple of weeks ago with the us australia mm -hmm. and the uk to finalize the title make sure everyone was happy and to kind of go ahead with it from mm -hmm. there so so again collaborative process yeah which is great. yeah and <laughs> chanel's got a good question she says um do you believe in writing so do you believe in the rule of writing every single day i'm an aspiring writer and i've heard that so much but realistically it doesn't make sense to me um, I am not, I don't write on the weekends mm -hmm. and from when I started writing, it was always do, even if you do 15 minutes a day, Elizabeth Gilbert has this amazing um, blog post on her website and she talks about the best tool in a writer's arsenal is the humble kitchen timer. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess you could use your phone timer or something like that. And she says, you know, it's possible to write a book in 30 minutes a day. That's all you need. And everybody can find 30 minutes in a, uh, in a day you know everybody can watch tv for half an hour less or, or get up half an hour earlier or use their lunch break for half an hour to write you know finding an hour or two hours is not achievable obviously for most people but finding half an hour actually is and you know that's basically what i did when my had my young kids you know i knew i could always get at least half an hour out of them sometimes it was only half an hour and i would use that to write and that's how my first few books got written in those small time slots because a book grows with every scene that you write. A mm. scene becomes a chapter, a chapter becomes, enough chapters become a book. Um, and I think that for me personally, um, I'm always more productive sort of by Wednesday when I've had Monday and Tuesday behind me than I am on Monday. Monday's slow because you've had two days off over the weekend and it's sunny mm. again. So I feel that often if you only write every second or every third or every fourth day, each time you're studying again and you're slower whereas mm -hmm. if you can just get a couple of consecutive days in there i think that really helps the writing process i mean of course every writer has to find their own process and everyone is different and i would never say anyone should do something mm -hmm. um but i guess that's how, what i have found really helpful and i like that i've always loved that idea of elizabeth gilbert's that you know it's possible for most people to find 30 minutes most yeah, day, and that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. um patricia wonders what you enjoy reading yourself and i'm wondering if maybe there's something that you've been reading lately that you could recommend to us 
Sure. So I read pretty widely. I read, obviously I read historical fiction because yeah. um, that's my love, but I read contemporary. I read a little bit of crime, but I get really bad nightmares. So it's got to be quite mm. um, gory, if that's a word, <laughs> crime. Um, I read memoir. I read all kinds of things. So I'm, I'm a big reader. I've just picked up um, uh, Amor Toll's The Lincoln Highway from the bookshop on the weekend because I loved A Gentleman in Moscow and Rules mm. of Disabilities through previous books. So I haven't started that yet, so I can't don't know whether to recommend it, but if it's as good as the last two, it should be amazing. Mm. Um, also, um, one of my highlight books this year, I would have to say, would be Meg Mason's Sorrow and Bliss. Oh, okay, I just yeah. devoured mm. that. Mm. I, you know, it was so funny, but so heartbreaking all at the same time. And mm. I just admired the skill to be able to write a book about a serious and heavy topic, but in a way that often had you laughing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah, thanks for those recommendations. Um, Tasman wonders if you get involved in writing workshops to help budding authors. Yes, I used to teach a lot, um, and I love to teach writing workshops. Unfortunately, the last couple of years I haven't done much at all because it's mm. just – been so busy and finding the time to do that has been really challenging but I really miss it um so over the last and particularly over the last couple of years with COVID and everything I've done a couple of online workshops with the Queensland Writer Centre so when organisations like that ask me and they're doing all the marketing and publicity and I just have to literally turn up on the day with my course and I tend to say yes yeah. um, I used to run my own private course okay. as well but mm. I just I don't really have the time for that at the moment I'm hoping mm. that you know next year or the year after I might be able to get back into that a little bit more because I do miss it and I mm. you know I remember how valuable writing courses were to me yeah. when I was starting out mm. so I'd love to be able to keep giving some of that back mm. um but it's been really tricky time-wise um mm. the last couple of years yeah you know every minute of every day suddenly seems to vanish into the abyss. <laughs> yeah especially when you've got three children as well yeah yeah that was <laughs> maybe i should have stopped at one or two but i love them so. <laughs> um Anne wonders how you did your research for your the book you're working on at the moment um with it be, like not being able to travel and things like that how did you find the research so i was really lucky for next year's book when i was planning to go to Paris and, and Europe in December 2018 and 19 mm. to research the Riviera House. It was about a month before we left. I don't know, clearly it was some premonition or something, but I suddenly had this urge to book in this extra week um, mm. going through Switzerland and Italy, oh, which we had a plan to do mm. and weren't part of, but we, we did it. We booked it all in, we rearranged everything, we added the extra week on and, and we did that which was fantastic because part of next year's book is set in Switzerland and Italy during mm. the Second World War because those are the kind of theatres of war that have been underwritten about, I think. And, you know, thank goodness I did that because I have not been able to go back to Switzerland and Italy yeah. since then. And um, ideally I would have gone back specifically to take photographs of certain places, but what I did in that week has been enough to be able to write the book and i you know i've been to switzerland and italy before it wasn't mm. my first time or anything but mm. you do tend to look at different details very specifically when you've got a particular scene in mind for example mm. and because it was so early in the ideas process for that book i i didn't have the scenes yet i just had the broad idea so so that's been great and of course i've been to paris enough times that um the paris part of the book came very easily yeah and also one of the the great things about i mean it's hard to say there are good things about COVID, but one of the things that's been really interesting to see the shift in this last year or so is that whereas previously you had to go physically visit an archive and request the documents and, mm. and be in the archive and look through them now i'm able to email archivists because the archives have all been closed and tell them which documents I'm looking for. And they've actually just gone and scanned them in for me and emailed oh, them to really, me. That's so good. that's been great. Yeah, so I've been able to get great. hold of a lot of documents mm -hmm. that way. Um, obviously, I think that might change now that things are opening up. But yeah. um, at the moment, they're still, you know, they love to help and they do whatever mm -hmm. they can. So mm -hmm. that's been great. Yeah, that's good. Um, so says, obviously, writing is a creative art and you write about fashion design, photography and art. Are the arts a particular interest for you? 
And do you pursue any of these arts yourself in addition to your writing? Um, yes, I've always loved the arts. I've always been an avid theatre goer, ballet goer, art gallery goer. Um, I'm not a very good photographer. Mm. <laughs> um, but if I love, you know, exhibitions, all that sort of thing. I just think that, um, you know, when you're working in a creative environment, other creative pursuits can really fuel your own creativity. Yeah. So I try to make sure mm. that as much as possible, you know, at least every month I've done something creative, whether it's, you know, going to the theatre or a ballet or going to an art gallery or doing something like that. Mm. Um, but I've always considered myself to be a terrible drawer. Or mm. I've, I've never considered myself to be a person who can draw. But last year in the sort of first COVID lockdown, I did uh, a couple of online courses with fashion oh, illustration because yeah. it's something I've always loved mm. looking at. And I just loved it so much. And it was hugely fun and so I started just posting pictures on Instagram of my very bad first attempts mm. just because I think you know when people pick up a book you know they've seen the final revised version and so for aspiring writers that's quite daunting but that's not how it looks at yeah. the start by any mm. means so with the fashion illustrations the idea of posting up my very early attempts was to show that you know we all start somewhere with something and mm. then it's only with practice and going over it again and again that you actually get better so mm. I kind of was trying to use that to mimic the the journey of writing a book and how a book actually becomes the polished thing that it is mm. and show that you know even someone like me starts off at a really basic level and then it's only the work and the effort that makes it get better mm. so that was been really fun yeah <laughs> yeah sounds like it um danielle wonders what inspired you to become a published author oh, i was really my love of reading um yeah. like i said before i read a lot from the time i was very young and i loved that sense of being completely swept away into the world of the book. And I always wondered, oh, you know, what would it be like to be the person who, who made someone else feel that, you know, to be the author. Mm -hmm. And so I started actually writing little books when I was a kid. My mum has all these books and poems oh, and that stories that I wrote. Yeah, wow. yeah mm -hmm. like relics of my childhood. Mm -hmm. So it was always something I did. And then I guess it was really just that um, when I finished high school, you know, it was like, well, how do you become a writer? I didn't really know how to do that. It wasn't like you, you know, if you wanted to be a teacher, you did an education degree mm. and you got a job in a school and that was a really clear pathway. So I did do a marketing degree and then I came back to writing later in life, which I think was better for me. I had more mm. life experience and more emotional range and all those things I think help. I wouldn't have been able to write these sorts of books, you know, 20 years ago yeah. most likely so mm. yeah so it was something I always loved and I'm I literally wake up every day and think wow I'm so lucky that I'm actually living my dream <laughs> yeah yeah and do you have a network of writer friends yeah I do actually so I've got a bit of a network here in WA mm. um so every second Wednesday I meet with three other writers um, Louise Allen, Holly Phillips, and Holly Craig at the at a cafe, and we write together oh, and, nice. um, yeah. and do that sort of thing. And then mm. my very good friend Sarah Foster, who writes amazing um, psychological suspense, mm. she and I have always exchanged manuscripts with each other, okay. and we give each other feedback, mm. and she's got a really good eye. Mm. And then I've got some great writer friends on the East Coast as well, who I'm really missing because I haven't been able yeah. to see for them for the last couple of mm. years as book tours get cancelled every year. Mm. So I'm fingers crossed next year I'll be able to go and catch up. But at least, you know, we can chat over, you know, Facebook Messenger is the best thing for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And being in Perth, is that my, were you still able to do a book launch? Yes, I was. So I was really lucky. We were able to do quite a lot of events here. Yeah. In fact, there was a lot of interest in events um, because there haven't been events for such a long time. Mm. So I was able to do, I did about probably 10 or 12 oh, events okay, here at Perth, right. which was great. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, not the East Coast, but mm. next year, I hope. <laughs> mm, hopefully, yeah. Um, <laughs> Belinda wonders how you choose the names of your characters. And I presume some of them are true names, aren't they? Yeah, so yeah. some of them are, obviously, mm. if they are a real person, then I use their real name, unless I feel like I'm deviating from their story so much that I need mm. to write a character inspired by rather than the actual person. But yeah, names are a really interesting one. It's, you know, you, you kind of come at, I can't really write the character properly until I have their name, mm. but it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing because 
if you haven't written the character, then you don't really know much about them. So how do you know if the name suits them? So it is quite an interesting little conundrum that. But mm. it's something about just stumbling upon the right name that you know it's the right name. And, and sometimes the characters do come, you know, that is their name from the outset. So yeah. Jessica May from the French photographer, she was always going to be Jessica mm -hmm. May. And I don't even know why. It was mm. just going to be her name always and forever. Um, whereas in this one, Eliane, I had a list of different names that I kind of added to and, and looked at and played around with. And then that was the one that kind of fell out as being the right name. And, you know, Sky in the Paris Secret. I mean, she's a pilot. So just yeah. a fun calling her Sky. That was, yeah. you know, she was never going to be anything other. As soon as I thought of that name, I was like, that is her name. Mm -hmm. So you just know, it's a bit mm -hmm. of a gut. There's a lot of gut instinct in writing. Um, you know so much <laughs> um although obviously there's a lot of craft and, and things that can be taught but there's mm. still a lot that just comes mm. from intuition and naming is a part of that so yeah. sometimes it's just writing lists down and looking at those baby name websites and seeing mm. what comes up and sometimes you just know the name from the outset mm. so have you also had the situation where you've used a name right through the book and then realized it wasn't the name and changed it all um, I did in, so her mother's secret, the main character mm. is Leonora or Leo, everyone mm. calls her for short. And I think she started out as being Ivy or something. Okay. And it just wasn't, yeah. it was too formal and too, I don't know, for me, it felt too, it just didn't feel like her. Mm -hmm. So she, I, but I did, I got to the end of the first draft and went, no, that's not her name. I need to rename her. Mm. And then there was another secondary character in the Paris seamstress who had a name that I actually decided I really quite liked and wouldn't mind saving perhaps for a main character somewhere down the track because you start to run out of good names. Yeah. You just form a good name. Yeah. And it's like, especially <laughs> male names. Mm. I'm like, oh, there just aren't enough ones that I like. So, mm. um, so you don't want to waste potentially a good name on a secondary character. Yeah. So shit, her name got changed <laughs> in the structural edit. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and Kirsty wonders if um, you have a book that's been the favourite to write. I think it's always your most recent book. Yeah. So like the Riviera House was my absolute favourite of all my books. And then now that I've been writing The Three Lives of Alex St. Pierre, that is absolutely my favourite book and my favourite heroine. And I'm completely in love with that story and her character. So, yeah, I think it's just because, you, you know, you have to be intensely into the book you're writing. So therefore it, it occupies the biggest space in your heart. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you start engaging in conversations with readers online where you're talking about, you know, their favourite characters in my books and they say, oh, you know, Jessica May, and you think, oh, yes, God, I loved Jess so much. I <laughs> loved that book so, so really they all are in a way. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering what you hope um, readers will love about your books. Um, so I guess the main thing that I like to try and do is find these women who did remarkable things in history and whose stories have been largely forgotten by history. Mm. And, and I like to try and, you know, bring them back to people's attention and say, look, you know, these women are incredible, they're worth remembering, they're worth finding out more about. And there's nothing better for me than when a reader reads one of my books and then sends me an email or a message to say, oh, you know, wow, after I finished the Riviera House, I went and did all this research on Rose Vallon because I wanted to find out more about her. Yeah. Or after the Paris Secret, I went and researched Catherine Dior because she was amazing. Yeah. And that's the best compliment that any reader could ever give me. Yeah, yeah. And what do you find the most difficult part of your writing process? First drafts. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I love to rewrite. Um, and I think that does come down to the fact that I don't plan a book up front. I try and I just can't. It just doesn't work for me. So um, because I don't really know what the story is, the first draft is quite stressful because I am literally hoping that this idea I have will turn into a story. Mm. And that as it turns into a story, I'll be able to tie the plot together and have it end somehow. And I never know those things until I've got to the end of the first draft. When I'm rewriting, it's like, okay, here's the story. It's all here. Now I just have to make it better. But the first draft is all quite, you know, I'm afraid that it's not going to work, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. <laughs> and Wendy's got a really great question. She wonders if you keep a record of all your characters and their characteristics, etc. I used to do that a lot in my first yeah. couple of books mm -hmm. and you know I guess that you know was for me part of my writing apprenticeship and learning how to write mm -hmm. and um learning how I needed to be able to develop a character so that 
in the book, they appeared well-rounded and authentic. And now I don't do that as much because I tend to find that as I'm writing that first draft, a lot of that is is character development. Um, I'm not just working out what the story is, but I'm working out who these characters are and what their backstories are and what kind of people they are, what, how they would react in certain situations and that sort of thing. So, um, so yes, it's a really good practice and something I definitely used to do, um, but it's not something I feel like I need to do anymore. Um, so um, the character tends to emerge organically from the story as I write it. Mm -hmm. And if you could be a character from your book for one day, which one would you choose and why? Oh, that's such a good question. Oh, I'm, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say it's Alex St. Pierre from next year's book because she's the publicist at the House of Christian Dior and yeah. he gives her <laughs> Dior gown. So like, oh my God, that would be my dream. So I'd be her in a flash. <laughs> oh, that's a good answer. And what advice would you give to a new writer? I think that writing is really a combination of three things. Um, it's hard work, of course. You've got to sit down at your desk every day or, or many days at least and write write the words. So you have got to work really hard. You've got to be prepared to rewrite more than you thought was ever possible. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a combination of talent. So trying to develop your talent by going to writing courses and you know, coming to events like this and listening to writers talk about their process and going and listening to, you know, live events when we get those back and, and again, mm -hmm. hearing writers speak, um, so developing your talent, but also it is a lot of luck. And so to get the luck, you've got to do the hard work and develop the talent and just hang in there. Yeah. You know, giving up often seems like something you should do because you've tried and tried and tried and it hasn't worked. But, you know, Sometimes if you just keep trying for that little bit longer, the luck comes and it finds you and then everything changes and you look back and think, wow, imagine if I'd quit. No, I wouldn't be here yeah. now. That's happened to me. Yeah. So, so I yeah. think that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. no, that's great <laughs> advice. Um, Chanel wonders if you could ever repeat a name. I know your books are standalone, but would you ever repeat a character's name? Not a main character's name mm -hmm. in to another main character, but I have mm. repeated character names in a secondary capacity. In fact, I was thinking about that the other day. I was thinking, oh, I've used that name already, mm. but it, it was okay because it was a secondary character or, or I was using a main character's name as a, as a secondary character or something mm. like that. So so I will in some circumstances. And of course, sometimes you have to because the real life character's name is that name and you can't change it. You've yeah. got to use it in another book. So yeah. you, just, you have to just go ahead with it. Um, mm. But I also, because I do like to have characters from previous books pop up and do little cameos in okay. the next book. Yeah. So I try not to mix the name too much because then that can be confusing. Yeah. Uh, or looking out mm. for those cameos. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And do you do anything to celebrate when you finish a book? Um, not so much when I finish a book <laughs> because I guess I'm never quite sure when the book is finished. I mean, I know it's finished when you've done the final proofread where your publisher is right, you can't change it anymore. Yeah. But I don't know, I guess because then it still feels like, well, it hasn't been published yet. So there's nothing to really celebrate mm. yet. So. So I guess it's more, I will always celebrate when the book is published. Mm. That's probably more so when I sit down with a nice bottle of champagne and go, yay, <laughs> it's done. I can't change it anymore. Yeah. It's printed. <laughs> and what's your idea of a successful writer? Someone who's really happy doing what they do and whose readers love their books. Mm. I think that's it, all you can possibly ever aim for, you know, it's so tempting to set those uh, external goals of all oh, successes when I get this publisher or when I sell this many books or when I hit this bestseller mm. list. But, you know, every time we do that and we achieve one of those things, and I'm talking about this from experience, you then suddenly become dissatisfied with that because then you set yourself a new goal, something yeah. else you want to achieve. Whereas mm. that thing that you just achieved was something you would have been so happy with two mm. years ago. And mm. all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, it's not enough. I need this. So so for me, I've learned that it really is all about just being happy with what I'm writing and loving what I'm writing and finding readers who love that too. Like that's success. Mm. Happy readers, happy authors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're writing, do you have a favourite snack or drink? I, I'm a big tea drinker 
thankfully I don't like the taste of coffee because if mm. I drank as much coffee as I do tea, I would be like, I'm never <laughs> sleeping for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, so I do drink a lot of tea and I don't tend to snack so much as really, I I guess, cups of tea are my, mm. are my rightly oh. snacks. God, yeah. I'm so boring. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much for talking to us. It's been great chatting oh, to you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks to everyone for watching. And thank you for those great questions. It was yeah, lots of fun being able to answer questions. those questions. Thank yeah. you. And can you tell people watching um, how they can keep in touch with you? Of course. So I am on Facebook and Instagram quite a lot as Natasha Lester Author on both of those platforms. And you can also find me on my website, which is natashalester.com.au, where I do have lots of photographs and blog posts about my research. So if you want to know more about that, that's a good place to go and have a look. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Thanks a lot. And thanks everyone who joined on. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.